Well, good day, everyone. Great to see you. We are starting our Shalom Church service online, which today I have called On the Way to the Promised Land. And today I'm going to introduce you to some of my AI friends. AI means artificial intelligence, and no one will that you see today talking, except for me, that is, are real. And I've created them on my computer with a program called AI Face Generator. And they will talk to you with the help of a program called Voice Maker and Photo Speak. So look out for Natasha, Jono, Grace, Michael, and Evan. And they're going to help me with the service this morning. We've been looking at an overview of the Bible and now specifically the book of Exodus, the second book of the Bible. The book of Exodus follows on from the story of Genesis. The descendants of Abraham have moved from Canaan all the way to Egypt, but they have become slaves and they've remained as slaves for 400 years. And then God appears to a man called Moses. Natasha, will you read to us from Exodus 6? Exodus 6, 3 to 7. God said, I appeared to Abraham as El Shaddai, God Almighty, and I reaffirmed my covenant promises to my chosen people. Under its terms, I promised to give them the land of Canaan, where they were living as foreigners. You can be sure that I have heard the groans of the people of Israel, who are now slaves to the Egyptians. And I am well aware of my covenant with them. Therefore, say to the people of Israel, I am the Lord. I will free you from your oppression and will rescue you from your slavery in Egypt. I will redeem you with a powerful arm and great acts of judgment. I will claim you as my own people and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God, who has freed you from your oppression in Egypt. Thanks, Natasha. You're welcome, Chaplain. Well, coming out of Egypt was a logistical nightmare. Led by Moses and driven by their faith in God, the people of God, who had suffered severely under Egyptian rule for 400 years, can you imagine that? Now they're headed to the land that God had promised them. And there were a lot of people. There were men who were able to fight and protect them. And then there was a priestly tribe as well. And besides these, there were wives, children, older men and women. So let's see how many people were there. There were 600,000 men who were able to fight and protect them. And then there were their wives, that's another 600,000. And then children of the soldiers, let's say at least four per family and probably a whole lot more. So that's about 2,400,000. And then there are the wives and the children of the men who were not soldiers, that's another 400,000. And then there was the priestly tribe of Levites, 22,300 of all ages, right from babies to men. And the wives of the Levites, that's about 10,580, plus their children, that's about 34,320. And then a mixed multitude of people who went with them, let's say on conservative estimate, that's about 2,033,600, let's say. So altogether, that's about 6 million people who became migrants, men, women, and children. Now imagine for a moment, 6 million people moving house and going to Sinai. I was interested in this, so I asked my removalist friend, Jono, the logistics of moving that many people. Hey Jono, what would you need to move six million people? Well, mate, 
you'd need at least six million cardboard boxes for a start, one for each person in the family, and that's if they all travel light. You'd probably need about 600,000 workers to pack. How many trucks would you need? Well, if two families shared a truck, it would take about 300,000 trucks to load up. And then there's the problem of crossing the Red Sea with all those trucks. You'd need about 50,000 ferries to take those trucks across the Red Sea, I reckon. Otherwise, you'd need God to open up the sea so we could drive across. And even then, we'd need a six-lane highway to get across without delays. And that's with no other traffic. You'd also need insurance, so we're talking big bucks. So far, about $300 million, at least. Thanks, mate. No worries. I also talked to my friend Grace, who is a travel agent and a bushwalker. What would you need to take six million people on a bushwalking trip from Egypt to Mount Sinai? Well, that's a lot of people. Well, to start with, you'd probably need 600,000 maps of the surrounding areas of Canaan, one for each family group. They would all need a Cooper's and sunscreen. What places would they actually go to? Mainly desert, but when you got to the border of Canaan, it would be beautiful. You could visit some of the tallest people in the world who live there. They are giants. You could also tour the vineyards of Canaan. Apparently they have some of the largest grapes in the world. Perhaps tour Jericho with its massive walls. What would you actually need to feed six million people? You'll need an awful lot of sandwiches. In fact, we would need to arrange about 1,500 tonnes of food each day. That would require two freight trains each a mile long to transport it. The wood for the campfires for Billy T would require another freight train a mile long. Since we are all going to travel on foot, we'll need an awful lot of water. Probably 11 million gallons a day for 6 million people. That would require another six or seven freight trains with tank cars each a mile long, just to bring the water. I was wondering, is it dangerous in that area? Yes, lots of wild animals. Lions, wild dogs, snakes, spiders, scorpions, and bears. And then there is the most dangerous creature on Earth. Human beings. They don't like trespasses in that area. It's really dangerous. The Egyptians are people traffickers, and the Canaanites are lawless. On top of that, there are earthquakes in the area when the ground opens up and swallows up people, and bushfires. It's also easy to get lost when you are hiking. We could get stuck in the wilderness for the next 40 years. You could also get sick out there. Disease could spread quickly among that many people. There would be no ambulance service out there to take you to hospital. You would die a horrible death. Yes, there are risks. What about crossing the Red Sea? Everyone would be travelling on foot, of course. Well, that's a problem also. There are certainly no ferries big enough to carry six million people across the Red Sea. You would just have to hope that God sees fit to open up the Red Sea. Even then, it will need a path five miles wide. If it's too narrow, it will take about a month for two lines of people to cross. And I presume that would be too long. What about where they'd be staying each night? Well, that's another problem. Each time you set up camp at the end of the day for 6 million people, you will need a campground about 1,200 square kilometres, 34 kilometres long and wide. And by the way, you'll also need some very good travel insurance. And I hope your visas are up to date. You could be regarded as illegal immigrants and they have built a wall around Jericho to keep illegal immigrants out. Well, thanks, Grace. I can't imagine what it would be like leaving the life of slavery and wandering in a desert for what proved to be 40 years. The books of Exodus, Numbers and Deuteronomy describe the struggles and the defeats and the victories 
which this massive number of people experienced as they plodded through the desert and wilderness on their way to the promised land. But then a crisis arises. You couldn't expect anything but a crisis with such a great group of people and a great migration of people. But before we listen to what happened, let's sing our next hymn. We've been talking about the story of the book of Exodus, where six million slaves finally got their freedom and began to leave Egypt. They were God's chosen people, but not because they were any better than anybody else. God had made a promise to Abraham that his descendants would be blessed and be a blessing to the world. But strained emotions, deep fears, anxiety and insecurity plagued the hearts and the minds of the people as they left Egypt behind them. The departure had been swift and sudden, and there'd been no time to prepare provisions. The urgency of the movement demanded that they travel by day and by night. To expect calm and quiet in such circumstances would have been totally unrealistic. The people started to complain, and their desperation and crisis began to be evident. Michael, what's the problem? What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Would that we have died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate bread to the full, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Our wives and our little ones will become prey. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? 
Well, to tell you the truth, I'm with Michael. I would have felt the same way out in the middle of the desert and with nothing to eat and drink, wouldn't you? It's not as easy as we think. I mean, it's not as if there were any Big Mac outlets or KFC drive throughs But crisis permitted God to teach his people about faith and about trust. God does that with us also. Israel's real and imagined calamities proved to be training grounds in trust. When the spirit of desperation and crisis engulfed these wanderers in the desert, God always stood near with light and with strength. Evan, I believe you've got a quote about anxiety and faith. Yes, I have. Someone said, the beginning of anxiety marks the end of faith. The beginning of true faith marks the end of anxiety. What does anxiety do? It doesn't empty tomorrow of its sorrow, but it certainly empties today of its strength. It doesn't make you escape the trouble, but it makes you unfit to cope with it when it comes. There are 365 times when the words, fear not, appear in the Bible, one for each day of the year. Chaplain Ross, it seems to me that anxiety can be defeated by our trust in Christ. Thanks, Evan. Through God's miraculous care, he instilled confidence in Hebrew hearts that he was able to provide for every need, and he is able to provide for you too in your circumstances. God guided them by day and night, he fed them supernaturally. They learned by hardship what it was to have faith in God. And God uses many circumstances, both good and bad, to teach us about trusting in him. Crisis permits God to school us in trust. He provides for every need. The Israelites continually failed the trust test and it kept them in the wilderness for 40 years until they finally learned about what it means to have true faith in God. Well, we've been talking about the book of Exodus, which tells the story of the journey of six million people. Six million people to the promised land. Well, this is a statue of Moses. But with computer software, let's see if we can make him talk. I want to ask Moses some questions. Moses, it must have been a nightmare for you to organize six million people, men, women and children. How did you do it? Well, Ross, I suddenly became a man of prayer. Every time I had a difficulty, I took it to the Lord in prayer. And then I committed myself to communicate well. The people needed to learn what it meant to trust in the plans of God. But how on earth did you communicate with all those people? My father-in-law Jethro came up with a good plan for communication. I selected and trained leaders from every tribe. I gave them authority over 1,000 people. Some of them had authority over 100 people and some of them over 50 people. Others over 10. I communicated well with these leaders and they communicated well to the people over which they had authority. I delegated total responsibility to them, but anything they could not handle, they directed back to me. Organisation of this kind was vital to the very existence of God's chosen people. Without it, all of us would have died in the desert. Yes, but... You know, what about law and order with all of those people? Surely not everybody behaved themselves. Well, Ross, it took... God took care of all of that. Now that the people had experienced God's deliverance, guidance and protection, they were ready to be taught what God expected of them. On Mount Sinai, I received God's moral code of laws, the Ten Commandments. And then I received God's ceremonial code of laws concerning holy days like the Sabbath and sacrificial laws. 
and then I received God's social code of laws, including our diet, sanitation, quarantine, taxation, military service, and marriage. Well, what happened if people broke the law? We all had the responsibility to fulfill our destiny to be a blessing. So discipline was absolutely necessary. If an individual or a community acted in such a way as to jeopardize God's plans, then God's corrective judgment fell upon them like lightning. God doesn't stand for things like murder and assault, idolatry, willful violation of our spiritual responsibilities, blasphemy, jealousy, disrespect for authority and insubordination all had to be treated as if they were cancers threatening the very life of our nation. Well, thanks, Moses. I can see that discipline was so necessary. When people committed sin, God, like a surgeon, with a healing knife, cut those cancers out. The pain of it was difficult to bear, but it saved Israel's life and their destiny with it. Millions of lives in the future hung in the balance. If Israel had died, God's plan for his world would have died as well. Hence he disciplined, he rebuked, he commanded, he judged, but all because he loved them. God's promises to Abraham could not be sacrificed on the altar of a few people's disobedience. God's plan was bigger than the individual, bigger than the community, and bigger than Israel itself. So he wouldn't permit anything or anyone to destroy his will and his purpose for the world. Jesus would eventually come from Abraham's line. He lived a perfect life while he was on earth, fulfilling the moral code of the law. Jesus' death, burial, resurrection and ascension and session fulfilled the spiritual code of the law. And Jesus observed the laws of the land, paying taxes, etc., fulfilling the social code of the law. He died for our sins and changed the world, not by laws written on stone, but by laws written on the heart. Jesus doesn't force us to obey him, but when we trust in him, we want to obey him. Well, God bless you, church. Let's listen to our final hymn.
ability to deliver. Let us all thy grace receive. Suddenly return and never, never more thy time. Great to see you, everyone. God bless you today and always, of course. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this book of Exodus that speaks about schooling your people in trust. We pray that through our circumstances, through the circumstances that we face each day, that you would school us in trust in you. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, everyone. Have a great day.